me see if I can get it. Okay, mouse is up and running. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and start this live stream off. Now, I am super excited to host this first office hours in North America for Figma. Office hours is something we created in the pandemic that was like this, what's a way to open up the Figma office and open up Figmates to our great community out there so that you all can see our practices or just get to know us more. It's been such a fun one. And this one happens to be the most popular of all of our office hours. That's Figma like the pros where we bring in so many different Figmates in for rapid fire tips. Now, in case you didn't know, I am a human that happens to work at Figma. My name's Raji King. I'm a designer advocate on the community marketing team. And I get to interface with so many of you, so many great companies, and bring back feedback to make Figma such a better app. So it's such a rad job. I'm so, so fortunate to be in this position. I love it so much. Now, let's talk about this session. First of all, this session is going to be recorded, and it's going to be available on youtube.com slash Figma design. Now, if you're going to miss part of this or you can't stay for all of it, it's okay. It'll be on YouTube within a week. And we're actually going to chop this up into little five-minute segments to make it easier for you to jump into something that's more relevant for you. The other thing is there's lots of us in here, quite a lot of us in here. So use that Q&A button if you have a very specific question. Otherwise, we're going to end up losing it in the chat. So drop, use that Q&A button. It's at the bottom of Zoom. And then also set your chat to everyone. That way you're not just chatting to the hosts and the panelists. And you can see all this great community out here and be able to talk with them. And lastly, we have a code of conduct, but generally just be kind and encouraging. I know our speakers have put a lot of time into this to prepare for this. And so be kind to each other. That would be awesome. Now we have a really exciting live stream today. We have so many different things to talk about and so many great speakers, as you can see here. We're gonna be talking about things from design, product design, design systems tips, research, brand, engineering, product management, sharing some cool plugins, Figma and Fig Jam. So this is going to be packed. So stay focused. Uh, and with that, we're just gonna jump right in. Uh, we're gonna jump right in and let's go. And I'm gonna bring up our first speaker. So our first speaker is none other than Damien Carell. Now, Damien Carell is actually our creative director on Figma's brand studio team, working to give shape and form to the way that Figma shows up in the world. I absolutely love that definition. It really makes things like flexible for what brand really is. Now, Damien is into making rugs. He picked up recently a rug tufting machine and last year has been slowly moving away from the pixels and the vectors that we all use so much into using more yarn. Damien, we're so glad to have you. Come on up, let's see what you've got for us. Thanks, Raji. Hi, everyone. I'm Damien. I'm the creative director on the Brand Studio team. Today, I was going to run through some deck making and presentation tips and tricks I've picked up over um, the past few years. So um, let's get into it. Um, first, Figma is a pretty formidable presentation tool. Um, and slides are slide presentations are pretty in a pretty important format. You know, they speak this common language. Uh, to your cross-functional teams and your stakeholders to understand your designs and your design process. Um, so let's let's hop right into it. Um, first things first. Um, actually, sorry. There's a. I went past the. One second. There we go. First things first. Um, Figma presents frames in a sequence relative to their position on the canvas. So regardless of what you call them or how you number them or the sequence, they are um, ordered in the layer panel. They're always going to read from top left to bottom right. Uh, when you're in presentation view, you might see your slide at 100%, and uh, this might not be totally ideal. Um, so if you just smash the, the Z button there, um, you'll get you'll cycle through all of the different uh, all the different zooms. Usually you want to fit to width. Um, if you're comfortable working with others in the editor, you're probably you probably already know about observation mode, which is basically screen sharing. Uh, you can follow along with uh, whatever your collaborator is seeing. Well, in presentation view, you can also observe in the same way by just clicking the uh, the person's avatar. This is a this is one of those like understated features that allows various team members. If you're presenting a, a larger project. Um, you can have specific members of the team speak to their slides and avoid that, you know, please advance to the next slide, next slide, or, or the changing of a screen sharing on a video call. 
Uh, now onto the creating slides. I, I typically use the same foundational grid for all the decks and decks templates that I make. Um, you want something flexible, but you don't want it to have too much optionality there. You're, 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 after all, you're using these, you're using this for uh, spatial continuity. I tend to go with a 12 column grid. I think it works pretty well, uh, but you can get away with something simpler like an eight or six column grid. Uh, for vertical placement, I recommend keeping it even simpler. So here's a two, uh, two row grid that I use. Uh, this helps define the bottom and top margins. And it also uh, makes it, um, it gives us a way to bisect the middle of the, of the horizontal there. Um, so we can use that for other spatial, present, uh, spatial placement. I also set the gutter to zero. Uh, which has this added benefit of rendering a simple three-line grid. And, and this really helps reduce the complexity and the noise when you're layering these on top of each other. But um, with this grid, you can get away with, you can create most of the canonical slide uh, templates that, that you might need to make. Um, this is a, a pretty simple split down the middle, large image on the right, text on the left. Uh, to show and hide um, uh, your grid, uh, it's a um, very, very, very simple shortcut there for both Mac and Windows. Um, but that layout grid, you can get away with making the, I think, the most powerful uh, layout, which is using using the thirds layout here. So having a having a large image on the right, um, and then having some space for text on the left, and then also the most popular uh, slide uh, template, which is the, the three up. Everyone loves a three up. Figma has a lot of advanced copy and paste features that can help uh, when slide making. Uh, one, common, one I commonly use is the copy, copy and paste properties shortcut. Um, this allows you to, like if you're, if you're working on a deck that has slides coming from a variety of sources, this allows you to create some consistency. So um, you can use textiles for this, sure, but if you're moving pretty fast, this can quickly take a Franken deck and make it a little bit more consistent. Uh, another um, copy and paste feature I love is, is multi-paste, and this is actually an easy one, and it, it, it's um, just Command V. Um, and what this does is if I select an element and then I select a bunch of different frames, uh, if I copy that element, I paste it. If, I'm, if I have all those frames selected, it just retains, it pastes them in there and it retains the positioning value. So this is helpful for um, a logo or a title that you want to include on all the slides. Uh, this, this one is super hacky, but um, it's been helpful. If you're, if you're preparing a presentation and you need to skip a few slides, um, so you could, this could be an appendix or a slide that's maybe not ready for prime time or not relevant to that audience. You can just select it and because Figma select it and group it and because Figma uses um, presents frames, it won't present those groups, but they'll still be present on the page. Um, presentation view doesn't support speaker notes, unfortunately, and I've heard there's a plugin that does do this, um, but I haven't yet tried it. My workaround really is to just craft the speaker notes inside the um, um, inside the the editor I use just like a text component below it uh, this helps when if you're rehearsing it you can use it in the editor mode and Clara actually has a tip later that 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 makes this uh, workflow even even better um, but this also is helpful too when you have to send a deck out um, perhaps they didn't catch your vo it's a pre-read. Uh, it's a it's a takeaway. Uh, this helps give some reference to the the slides that that were presented. Um, and then lastly, um, put a prototype on it. Um, this is one of those powerful features that if you add a simple scrolling prototype, say it's a, of a website um, within the slide deck presentation. So you're running through, you're setting up the designs, um, you're setting up the story, and then you you get to um, a high fidelity mock. Um, you can just scroll within there. And it's really helpful to, to talk through, um, uh, instead of uh, pacing it out on multiple slides, just having that there and to be able to talk to it live with um, the people that you're presenting to. It also tends to, um, the first time you do this for a client, it kind of like blows their mind. It's, it's like, is this a presentation? Is this a prototype? It's both, but, um, but thank you all for the time. Back to you, Raji. Damien, uh, thank you so much for those uh, rad tips. I remember the first time that I learned about the observation mode in 
prototype mode and that blew my mind like 10 different people presenting together but none of the like can you advance my slide like great tip and i think that people love that group as you called it hack tip so thanks for dropping some deep knowledge there damien so cool all right we're gonna move on our next speaker here is kelly lee now Kelly is a product designer on the growth team focused on helping users discover how Figma can help them in their day-to-day -day workflow. Recently, Kelly got into pottery and Kelly's on this mission to see if she can create a mug large enough to contain a latte. I'd love to hear more about that, but Kelly, let's hear what you've got to share with us. All right, thanks so much, Raji. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly, and I am a product designer here at Figma. And today, I will love to share with you some of my favorite Figma tips and tricks that help me speed up my workflow. All right, let's get into it. So the first one here is uh, my preferred way to screenshot. As a designer, I am constantly perusing the web for inspiration, and I am saving them to my swipe file or just my file of all the inspirations that I find. Um, so the way that I like to do this on my Mac is to use uh, the shortcut command shift four, which copies the screenshot to your clipboard instead of cl cluttering up your desktop. And then from there, you can press space to select the window that you want to take a screenshot of. And if you want to remove this pretty intense shadow that comes with your window, you can hold down option, and that gives you a really clean screenshot that you can paste into your Figma file. Um, I haven't personally tried this out, but I have heard that on a Windows laptop, you can just use Alt print screen to do the same thing, which honestly sounds a lot easier than this. Uh, my next step here is how to quickly crop um, anything or an image inside of Figma. So you can just hold down Command or Control and then resize uh, the image. Uh, next up, now that you have all of these different images or screenshots inside of your Figma file, you can really quickly organize them using auto layout. So if you select all of your frames or images, then press shift A, that creates this auto layout container that you can then enter spacing for, and you can really quickly to ungroup these using command shift G, and this would get rid of all of these unnecess unnecessary frames uh, inside of your file. All right, next up, um, copy link on desktop. I think copying link is one of those features that we're taking for granted these days, you know, long gone are days where you need to export things just to share or download and re-upload a file. Um, this one is pretty new, but on the desktop app, we have added this new shortcut where you can press command L to quickly copy the link to uh, your clipboard. So we try to be smart with this, depending on what you have selected inside of your file, um, the link will copy to different sections of the file. So if you have a frame selected, someone clicking on the link that you shared will go directly to that frame that you have selected. Um, if you have a page inside of a multi-page file, the link will go to the page that you're on. And you know, if you have one single page and nothing selected, then the link will go to the entire file. Uh, next up here is another way to share, you know, sometimes all you want is an image um, and you can do this by selecting the things that you want to share and then pressing command shift C. So this copies everything that you have selected as a PNG and I love doing this just to share, you know, something to Slack and people don't need to click through to a link and they can just view the image in line. Um, and uh, this next uh, shortcut that I love is shift enter uh, or shift return. And this allows you to just go up and up in these nested uh, components or frames or whatever have you. And this is super useful for going up to a parent component when you're inside of it to detach it. I'm just kidding. Obviously you want it to go up to the parent component to change its variant. And the opposite of shift return is just pressing return. And this selects all of the children inside of an object. Uh, here, my next tip is paste or replace. Honestly, I don't remember this keyboard shortcut myself. I always just use right click um, and click on the menu item there. Uh, but combined with multi-paste, this is super useful for replacing frames with components. Um, so here you can see me using the return shortcut to select all of the notifications in this list and then using paste to replace uh, to replace all of these objects with uh, the proper component. 
And lastly, this is sort of a hidden shortcut, but I use it all the time. It's this design and prototype panel toggle uh, that you can activate with Shift E. So here I am quickly making this hover state of a button and then using Shift E to toggle over to the prototype panel and draw on this prototype noodle. Uh, and then you can just toggle back and forth using Shift E all the time. All right, um, those are all of my tips for today. And back to you, Raji. Kelly, thanks so much for those. I especially love the traversal ones. I use them all the time, like enter to select all children, shift enter to go back up to select the parent. And I, like so many people in this chat, absolutely agree that I don't know how to arrange my fingers to actually like, do the shortcut. So thank you for the right click. I'll use the right click menu. Awesome. So. Our next speaker up is going to be Jason Gann. Uh, just want to let you know that, hold on just a second, that Jason Gann is a researcher focused on Figma's editor, prototyping, and design systems capability. Uh, Jason's always game for a good action movie or early surf session. So if you're with those kind of things, definitely say so in the chat. He's trying to maintain a daily reading habit and currently reading the three body problem. Jason, can't wait to hear your tips on research. What do you got for us? Thanks, Raji. Hi, all. I'm Jason. I'm on the research team here at Figma. And today, I'd love to share a few ways in which I make charts in Figma. So you might um, first off be wondering, why create charts in Figma? Well, on the research team, we have one foot in the world of data and one foot in the world of design. You might have been on the receiving end of one of our surveys. And I want to first off say thank you so much for taking the time to share your feedback. And second, this is kind of a glimpse into the behind the scenes of what we do with that information. So here you can see a couple of examples of survey questions that we've turned into charts. And the benefit of bringing these charts and this data into Figma is that hopefully like many teams and many people out there, a lot of people live inside of Figma and FigJam files. So bringing the charts into, into the file gives it that kind of richer presentation quality, as you saw from uh, the slides talk that Damien gave. Like We love our slides. We love um, bringing these charts into design crits and brainstorm, uh, brainstorm uh, sessions where you can kind of come in here and you can, you know, you can edit these uh, and remix them further. And I just wanted to share um, a little bit about how I uh, create that. And the first method is just using a lot of the things that um, come out of the box with Figma. And so if you uh, take a few, just say basic shapes. So if we take a circle and we stack that on top of each other. Using the sweep tool, we can get this to the point where maybe we have a, a nice pie chart and just expose my panel there. Um, but personally, I don't really like pie charts. I think they're a little bit difficult to interpret. So uh, maybe instead of a pie chart, I want uh, a donut chart. So same as before, we'll use the sweep tool. And this time, we'll expose the ratio tool. And you can see we have the beginnings of a nice donut chart. And just as before, we can duplicate that and change the color, stack it on top. And there we go. Same thing, except um, just a different representation of, of the information. And the last thing I wanted to touch on was just using math operations. And if you're already familiar with this, um, what I like to do with math operations is say you wanted to create a bar chart. And if you're using one of the rectangles here as the reference point, and let's say we know that this is, I'm making this up, 60% of the original height. So if I just come in here and say multiplied by 0.6, and now I have uh, maybe this one is times 30% and this one, I don't know, is 10%. So now you can see if we take these shapes and we have the beginnings of a nice uh, vertical bar chart, of course, if we wanted to, we can you know, easily rotate this. And now we have, oops, now we have a horizontal bar chart. Um, and you can go on and add your, your labels and annotations and whatnot. Um, but you know, a lot of this is a lot uh, requires manual work and manipulation. And I wanted to share uh, a plugin that I came across about uh, a year and a half ago that really helps speed up this workflow. And this plugin is called Chart. So all you do is come onto the canvas, draw a shape, and I am going to hit uh, it's Command or Control slash for the Quick Actions menu. 
And whoops, uh, if I just type in chart there, you'll notice that there's a number of functions that are available to you. I won't spend too much time here, but just wanted to show you a quick example. If I click on create chart, it will expose um, some available options to me. I will call out that I am using a paid version of the plugin. There is a free version. It just limits you in terms of how many chart types you can use. But honestly, I only use a, a handful of these. So what's nice about this is uh, you can take a data set that you might already have. So I have something that I've already pasted to the clipboard and you can just paste it right in here. You can also sync it with uh, Google Sheets if you want to. And I am going to select grouped bar chart for this particular one or this particular example and click on create chart. And that looks pretty nice. Um, and what's nice about this is that you can use things within Figma, of course, say here in, in selection colors, click on that and let's say, I don't like um, that, that shade of blue, I'm gonna change it to something else. And um, normally what I would do at this point is customize it further. Maybe I wanna add some annotations just for fun, just to like really call out something. So for example, hey, there's these two groups that uh, answered this question you know, really differently. So I might um, you know, use, use things to, uh, to call those things out. Um, again, just really quickly on the plugin, if you wanted to edit these, um, the way that the chart is displayed, you can do so all within the, the plugin itself, which is nice. Um, you'll see here that I'm using a template that I've already configured, but you can also, if I say without template here, adjust uh, a lot of the settings, such as whether or not to show a grid, um, what you want for the labels. So if I hit edit there, you can see that now it's using a lot of things that are just uh, settings by default. So I hope uh, this was somewhat helpful and gave you a, a glimpse into uh, all of the wonderful feedback that, uh, or what we do with all of the wonderful feedback that you share with us. Uh, thank you so much. Back over to you, Raji. Jason, thanks so much for all you do on the research team uh, and sharing those very practical tips for us. I especially love that chart plugin and all of, <laughs> I think as I believe it was Brandon in the chat said, y'all put Excel in my design tool and uh, I couldn't agree more. It's very cool, very powerful. So thanks so much. All right, we're moving on and we're moving on to Clara Ugier. Now Clara's on my team. She's a designer advocate on the community team focused on helping teams design and scale cross-functionally. Uh, Clara is a dessert fiend who can't stop buying notebooks. Uh, I used to be her motorcycle buddy, but she recently sold her Suzuki Gixxer and now she's considering getting an electric motorcycle probably because of the sound in the city. So Clara, can't wait to hear what you have prepared for us. Come on up. All right, Clara, we're going to have to have you come off mute. I know we all do it. Classic. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Raji. My name is Clara and I'm on the community team. And today I want to share a few things that both I use all the time, but things that I get asked about a lot. So the first slide I have here and tip is presenting from the canvas. So sort of coming off the heels of what Damien shared, this can be super powerful. So the shortcuts that you're going to want to know is command period or control period that will hide the UI. We also have N for the next slide and then shift N from the previous slide. So let's check it out. Here, I just have my slide deck and the first thing I'm going to want to do is press that command period. So command period, boom, my panels are gone. And then now when I press the hotkey N, that's gonna take me to the slide and it's gonna resize it to either the max width or the max height. And so what's cool about this is now I can interact with the items on the canvas. Maybe you wanna showcase how to do something in Figma and then I'm just gonna move forward, continue to press N, N, Shift N again. And so this is really great for some of you Figma teachers out there. And I know some of you are on this call if you, you know, want to take someone through or take your team through how to use auto layout or anything on the canvas, this can be super powerful just to showcase exactly um, how things are working. So this can also be great for design crits. Maybe you're presenting your work and you just want to do a quick little iteration, um, update something. This can be super great. Next, I've got constraints and grids. So this was something I learned only after I joined Figma. So let's back out a little bit. 
And here, I'm going to start just with the concept of constraints. So if we take a look at this card here, you'll know the constraints applied to it based on these blue dotted lines. So if we take a look at our right panel over here, it's constrained to the left and to the right and also to the top, such that when I am resizing uh, my frame, left and right are fixed as well as the top. Now, when we get to a case where we have multiple cards, and if I just click into these again, you'll see those blue dotted lines fixed to the left and to the right and to the top. But now when we're moving it, it's not quite resizing as we are hoping. And so over on the right-hand side, I've saved a little grid. And you'll see here, I've just got my three column grid here. And what I can actually do is just copy and paste this grid. So I'm just gonna boom, command C, and then paste it over here. And now when I go ahead and resize it, you're seeing that, okay, now the cards are respecting the gutters that I'm really hoping for. They're set up with auto layout, so it's resizing dynamically. And it's nice that now, instead of the constraint uh, fixing to the parent frame, if I just move this a little bit, it's actually fixing to the grid. So you'll see that little blue dotted line show up there. Now with this idea, you can then nest all of these grids together. So right now, all of these are showing. What I have is a two column grid on my parent frame. I have a three column grid and a four column grid inside of that. So when we go and resize the frame, um, all of my gutters again are being respected. Let me turn off and sort of hide these grids. I just color coded them so you could see, but again, all of these items are being respected. So I absolutely love this. This blew my mind when I learned about it when I joined Figma. And then lastly, what I wanted to share was selectively sharing work. I would say this is one of the most common questions I get as a DA. If you have all of your work on a file, how can I selectively share a group of work? So let's say you have just your feature file. You've got a bunch of artifacts over in your pages. You've got research artifacts, slide decks, prototypes, et cetera. And maybe you really just want to share one portion of that. Something that you can do is upon presenting your maybe slide deck, so everything that Damien showed earlier, what you can do is select this sharing option to view prototype only. So what's really great about this, you just pop in your email, select that can view prototype only, and now they'll only be able to see this polished deck that you've created. It's still linked back and connected to your source file, but you don't have to worry about them sort of looking at maybe all of your scribbles. You just want to showcase that really polished piece of work. That could be really great. The second thing you can do is create a branch um, and just share out that branch. So let's say um, you just want to share a few of these pages. What you can do, hit that little carrot, create a branch. I've already created a branch for this example. So I just wanted to share my screens. Let's go ahead and open that. In this branch, what I have prepared are just the first three pages that I wanted to show. Now, again, I don't have to worry about the person I'm sharing this with to see all of my other messy stuff. And now I'm really curating exactly what uh, I wanna link out. And then next up, what's really neat is that you can go ahead and embed items outside of Figma. So sometimes you wanna tell a story to stakeholders who maybe aren't so comfortable being in Figma and that's totally fine. Something you can do is with that hotkey that we learned from Kelly, Command L, if I just wanna paste that into a documentation tool or paper doc or what have you, now I'm getting a preview of just this frame. And this is nice if you wanna tell a very specific story with your design, just select a few frames here and there. And something that's also neat is I have a nested frame inside of this frame. I can also go ahead and copy the link just to that frame. And when I go ahead and paste it into my documentation tool, I'm now seeing a preview of just that frame. So you can really granularly select which frames you want to embed out. You can even embed the entire prototype out into that uh, document that you have. And it can be a, another great way to bring out some of your work. So boom, just pasting that in. Now Figma's embed is going to render that entire prototype. And like Damien mentioned, because I have this in prototype view, 
with my slides, I can still interact with these scrolls in the prototype. So really powerful. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you so much. And back to you, Raji. Sarah, love those tips. Uh, <clears throat> I remember two years ago when I learned about grids and constraints. I actually didn't learn from the Figma team. I actually learned from one of you in the community. And I was like, how has this existed for a while? And I didn't know. Uh, such a mind blower. Also, such a great tip. Thanks so much for all of those, Clara. Those were awesome. Now we're going to move over into software engineering land. We're bringing up Dorothy Chen. Dorothy is a software engineer on the editor experience team in New York, working on making Figma's design editor more featureful and usable. Uh, currently, Dorothy is currently brainstorming how to fit a sewing machine into her closet-sized New York City apartment. I wonder how small that really is. I hope you can fit it, Dorothy. Come on up. I can't wait to see what you've got to share, Dorothy. Thanks, Raji. Hi, my name is Dorothy, and I'm a software engineer on the editor experience team. Um, so as a software engineer, I spend a lot of time not only creating Figma files, but consuming them. The classic case is, of course, I'm working with a designer and working on turning their Figma designs into code. And so today, oops, uh, I want to talk with all of you about some of the ways that I like to understand and interpret a Figma file, especially larger or more complicated ones. So we're going to be looking at Figma's UI2 design system file. Um, this is actually publicly available on Figma's community page. If you want to download it, play around with it, definitely feel free to do so. So at first glance, there's a lot going on and it's not really clear where we maybe wanna start. Um, in terms of basic information hierarchy, I like to always start with pages on the left sidebar. Sometimes it'll be collapsed also, so, so you can pop it open. Um, so it looks like this file has three pages. We've got a cover art, we've got some templates and extras, and it looks like main is where kind of the meat of our components is that we maybe want to implement. Right below the pages section, there are all of these layers. And luckily for us, these look like pretty well named. It looks like we've got categories of components, some banners, cards, navigation bars, and so on. So we're going to get a little meta. Let's say that I want to implement a sidebar. I can go ahead and select that top level layer press shift two to zoom to selection um, and things are already looking a little manageable. As a side note, if you're like me and can never remember keyboard shortcuts, the, the most powerful tool I like to use is the quick actions panel. So all you need to remember is command slash um, or command P to open that up. And so you can go ahead and just type in what you wanna do. So zoom to selection and no keyboard shortcut necessary. Cool, so now, we are looking at all of these different types of sidebars. Um, I'm going to focus on this first one all the way over here. Looks like it's a frame editing UI. And so now we're already at a place where we have a nice constrained UI that maybe we want to start building. Um, there's a couple of tools I like to better understand what's going on in here and kind of better understand the building blocks. So the first is using command to deep select. So now that we have this overall sidebar selected, we can press command and we'll be able to select an arbitrarily nested child. So we can select this drop down or even all the way down into the text. Of course, just selecting components is maybe not the most useful thing. So that's where option comes in or alt. Uh, so if I hold option, I'm able to see these measurement lines. So it tells us the, the pixels between the selected component and whatever my mouse is hovered over. Um, alternatively, if you open up the inspect panel, which has a wealth of other really useful information, no option needed, whatever you hover over will show those lines. Uh, another pair of useful tools that actually we learned from Kelly earlier is using return and shift return to traverse parent-child um, relationships. So if we go ahead, use, using command, click this kind of intermediate frame, pressing return shows us all its direct children and shift return, let's go back to this dropdown that we love, shift return shows us a component's direct parent. And so all of these things are just really nice to understand kind of the pieces that fit together in the hierarchy of information that make up this larger UI. Switching gears a little bit, I also want to talk a bit about instances and components. So if we look 
back at this layers panel on the side, you'll see that a lot of these components have that um, diamond icon next to them that also appears uh, in the inspect panel if we click on that. Um, and so that tells us that this component is an instance of a main component. We can follow this button to that main component. And so this is really nice because we can see all of the variants. Um, depending on the product or the UX that we're going for, I probably don't want to implement just this example uh, dropdown that was used in the overall sidebar UI. I probably care about implementing a hover state, a focus state, and so on. And components, main components, can be made up of instances themselves. So if we scoot over to this dropdown with an icon using command again, we can see that this icon itself is yet another instance. So let's follow that again. And we're looking at all of these components of icons. So this is useful in the case, let's say that I am trying to implement a dropdown with an icon, but don't necessarily want to use just this droplet icon. Um, I can see what else is out there. And more generally, I like to like follow around component uh, chains just to better understand the design system, kind of what's going on. Um, so we can click around, we can take a look. Um, and let's say that we've gotten a little lost. We wanna get back to that sidebar that we're actually working on. We can always zoom out all the way, get this overview, press option L to, oops, there we go. Option L to collapse all of the layers in the side and get back to that original sidebar the way we originally came and get back to work. And so, yeah, that's all I had for you all today. Hopefully some of these tips and tricks were helpful. Dorothy, thanks so much uh, for helping demystify a little bit of the engineering side. I especially love like the inspect panel and the fact that we can find the parent component and be able to kind of navigate around and get a bigger picture of what really the design system is, not just that component. So thank you for bringing in your engineering side and helping us out there. Uh, we'll stay a little bit on the design systems track. We're going to actually have Chad Bergman uh, come up. Chad is a designer advocate, once again, on my team, uh, focusing on learning and sharing design system tips and best practices with the community. I like to call him my design system dad because he really knows a lot. Uh, also, outside of Figma, Chad's crazy into hot sauces, building guitars, and is currently working on new music with his band. Chad, come on up. Can't wait for you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Raji. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. My name is Chad, and as Raji mentioned, I'm a designer advocate on the team here at Figma, and I talk with a lot of you out there in the community, so I'm um, really stoked to be here today and share some awesome tips for testing your component updates. So as a designer advocate, one of the questions that I often get from teams is, you know, how can they approach updating and then testing their design system assets within Figma? Now, one way that I've commonly seen teams do this, and I've done this myself, is to have two separate libraries. You know, use one as a sandbox library for updates in progress, and another that's published as a production library for teams to use. And in fact, one of our designer advocates, Louie, he just shared this example yesterday, and he added in here how we can use branching to even take it a little bit further. Now, what if we didn't need to use two separate library files, though, and have to worry about duplicating components back and forth? You know, if we take branching a little further and we combine that with the power of swap library, we can actually do some pretty cool things for testing our updates. So let's actually uh, try this out here. So I'm going to jump over into my library file here. And let's say that we are going to maybe get rid of some of the roundedness in our components. So I'm going to, rather than edit the main file here, because folks might be coming into the library and you know, wanting to see what that source of truth is. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to do my work here in a branch. And I'm just gonna prefix this and we'll just give it simple um, 
component updates. And now that I'm working in a branch here, I can make my updates to each of these components. So let's just select all of our button variants here. You know, let's just give this maybe uh, eight pixels uh, for our border radius here. And let's also do that on our drop downs. We're at four currently. Maybe let's box those off a little more, take that down to two. And let's do the same thing with our inputs here. Let's select each of the variants here. I'm holding down shift so I can go between both of these components. I'm going to take that down to two as well. Now, if I wanted to test this because I'm working in the branch, you know, I can't publish this library uh, being in a branch here. This is where swap library can get handy if you did want to test these out with actual product screens to see what the impact would be. To do this, I'm going to actually duplicate this branch into a new file. So I'm going to hit duplicate here, and it's going to tell me at the bottom that it's been duplicated. Now, if we take a look in the files here, I'm working in my libraries project, and here I have that branch as a new file. So I don't uh, cause any type of confusion if people are coming into it. I'm going to rename this as a best practice. I'm just going to throw a little emoji at the beginning here and say test um, library update. So now I can open up this new file created from our branch, and I can go ahead and publish this. So I'm going to go ahead and publish this since it's just for my testing. I'm not going to put in a description at this point. Now, once this library has published here, I can actually come into a screen that is being worked on. And let me expand this out here just so we can see a little bit more of the components. Now, a shortcut I could do is option three or to browse to see what libraries are used. I can hit my assets panel and then click on the team library icon here. Here I'll see all of my libraries and I can see the libraries used in this file. I want to swap out the components so I can see what those changes would look like. So when I click into it, I can see my swap library button at the bottom here. And I am, not, uh, I am not going to be able to swap my library today. So typically, we would swap our library there, and we would <laughs> switch that out for um, our test library. Um, life happens when we do it live. It's, it's part of the fun. But typically, we would swap that out, and we would hit this here and we would choose the new library. It would, of course, apply then our component updates where we could see it. And if everything looked good, we could go ahead then and say, great, we'd swap it back to look like this again. And then when we would come back into our uh, branch, we could go ahead and merge that, publish it out, and then inherit those updates right in the file. So uh, stay tuned. I'll also be posting a tip video of this, showing this in action on our uh, Figma tips playlist on the YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that. Throw it back to you, Raji. Awesome, chat. I know we get that question so many times, like how do you stage a V2 and test it? So thanks for doing the work and putting that together for us. Can't wait for the tip that you're going to put out there. All right, we're going to move on. We're going to go back into the land of research with Vanessa Van Steindel. Now, Vanessa is a UX researcher on the Fig Jam team, currently focusing on getting feedback on a bunch of new and awesome features for people who run workshops, which she's going to give us some tips on today. Uh, on the side, though, Vanessa's really into mushroom hunting, which is a thing, apparently. She does this in the forest with her French bulldog, Tipitina. You can also find her reading cookbooks from cover to cover, which is a fascinating, like, mind-blowing thing to... Vanessa, you'll have to share with me more, like, how you can read a whole cookbook cover to cover. But let's get into your tips. Can't wait to see what you've got. Thanks a lot, Raji. 
Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Van Skindel. I'm a UX researcher on the Fake Jam team, uh, and I'm live from the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, if you're new to Fig Jam, it's a digital whiteboard tool that we launched last spring. Um, as a researcher, I personally love using Fig Jam for a number of different activities. Uh, sometimes I'll open it up and just build a quick diagram to help me think through a user flow. Other times I'll pull up a board during a research session with a customer and uh, do a quick whiteboarding session, kind of the same way we'd stand at a physical whiteboard if we were in person. Um, but what I want to share today is how I've been using FigJam to share insights um, and information with my team in kind of a more interactive and engaging way. So a little bit of backstory on how I started doing this. So a few weeks ago, um, we finished a big round of customer research and spent several days writing up a big long report. And now that our team has been remote for two years, which is so crazy, um, the number of just screen share, Zoom presentations and linked paper docs is just starting to feel really, I don't know, kind of same old. It's just hard to differentiate from all the rest of the information that we're getting every day. Um, so we had this big brainstorming session scheduled for later in the week. And I just wanted to make sure that my team really understood the findings so they could go into the workshop grounded in customer insights. So here's what I created. So I made a board like this in Fig Jam. Um, and I'm going to talk through how I created the board and also how you can kind of make the most out of Big Jam for um, engaging your team. So I put my high level findings into these little insight cards here. And um, I took kind of the most relevant high level information and put it into a top insight, grabbed a quote, and then I embedded a video clip. And I sent this board to the team with some simple instructions, asking them to have a look and react. Um, and so here's how I built my board. Um, so these cards here are from um, a, a plugin called Blossom. Um, and you can create video clips and reels from research interviews. And I'll show you where that's at. So get kind of acquainted with this menu here. Um, and if you go into your plugins menu, you'll see that there's a plugin called Blossom. And if you run it, you can actually grab your videos and just drag them straight into the board. So your team can actually watch video clips um, directly from your FigJam board without having to leave and go to another application to watch videos. And it just keeps them really centered in the customer insights so that they don't have to try to open another software application and go all over the place. Um, other, video, um, other video platforms that we have integrations with are Vimeo and Loom. So if you have a preferred platform, you can also use um, those two plugins. Um, those are also under the plugins menu. So you see there's a Vimeo. Um, and then Loom, it doesn't look like I have that installed, but that's another option if that's what you like to use. And then um, I also just set up this little orientation for the team so that when they dropped into the board, they had kind of an idea of where to start. So I kind of had some fun with it here, um, kind of a start here with some um, kind of our fun stamps. And I asked them to like read the highlights, the insights, watch the video clips, um, I asked them to drop some stamps and um, kind of question stickies in where they had questions and ideas. And then um, I also just like to reserve a spot for the team to kind of have a little bit of fun with this. So once they've finished reviewing the information, we have this really fun uh, widget called the photo booth. And um, it allows you to, drag in a camera and take a kind of a quick photo. So as just a way to kind of take attendance and get people to engage with your findings. Um, another thing that I love to do um, for the team when they're going through the board is there's this little voting um, widget that I like to use for accountability. So at the end of uh, absorbing each insight card, I can ask the team to just say like, hey, I've watched that. And then as a researcher, I can see kind of how far the team has gotten, who's watched what, and it just kind of gives me a high level overview. And then when we move on to the discussion later, 
Um, if the team has dropped things like hearts or stickies or question marks, I'll kind of know where to start um, the discussion when we're together live before the brainstorm begins. Um, I also love to create a little holding pen for ideas that spring up during um, uh, while they're reviewing the, the insights. And this is kind of a nice place to just let them drop a sticky, um, kind of have some fun um, brainstorming ideas and things like that. Um, and then another widget that I love to use is this alignment widget. It's an alignment scale that you can drop into your doc. And if there's any kind of controversial hypotheses or interesting hot takes that you wanna get a pulse from your team on, you can drop this widget in. And it's called alignment scale. So you can just drop it right in. And then the team can kind of vote in different areas. And then you can reveal and see kind of where the team stands in terms of alignment around a particular idea. Um, so aside from sharing research insights, this format can be really useful for sharing any type of information. Um, our data science team uses FigJam to share screenshots of metrics dashboards. PMs also use FigJam to ask the team to weigh on, in on things like our vision um, and our planning documents. And hopefully you can reuse some of these tips to make sharing information during this kind of hybrid remote phase um, a little bit more fun and engaging. Hope you've enjoyed it. Back to you, Raji. Vanessa, thanks so much. I think a lot of people made jokes about it being a Fig Jam Tinder widget, um, but I love those widgets and all of those great insights. Blossom seems like an incredible plugin uh, just to share those research insights. I think these insights could apply to everyone, not just folks in Fig Jam or researchers. So thanks so much. Uh, we have a lot more, probably about 15 more minutes of this. So we're gonna rush right in. We're gonna go up here next is Aaron Tesfe. Now, Aaron is a software engineer at Figma who recently moved from the prototyping team to the FigJam team, most recently leading up to the code blocks launch. So if you've seen that code block widget uh, or block as we call them, uh, Aaron was behind that. Uh, currently, Aaron's really into health hacks like prolonged fasting and uh, optimizing his biological markers, which I have no clue about. Tell us more, Aaron. Uh, he also loves rowing in the Bay Area. Aaron, let's see what you've got for us. Uh, thanks, Raji. Uh, yeah, I'm Aaron. I'm an engineer on the Fig Jam team. And I want to talk to you about my favorite uh, Fig Jam plugins and widgets for running meetings. Um, so let's move on to, uh, first of all, one of my favorite plugins, which is Flyover. So imagine you are presenting your screen and in Figma design, you don't have access to uh, moving slides, uh, but you want to focus on certain areas in, in the canvas here. Flyover is a cool plugin where you can have certain views set up and move to, uh, to them, name them. You can update your views. For example, we're gonna go to my first, uh, uh, first uh, widget that I really like, which is uh, regarding agenda. And you notice it just zooms in on a certain area. So flyover is pretty cool. So, uh, so now you've, you're, you're about to start your meeting and you want to keep it on time in certain sections. Uh, Figgenda is cool where you can create certain timers uh, for certain sections of the meeting. And then you can press play and uh, the timer will run and it will auto, um, it will move forward to the next part after your set time for a certain section. So yeah, so that's, that's a cool one. And the next one we'll check out is regarding uh, sort of the first part of the meeting. Maybe you wanna do an icebreaker, Maybe you want to um, have a question like a this or that. Uh, and this is, this is a cool plugin called this or that. You can have a, a question set up uh, and have two options. Here, our question is, where are we going for our team dinner? Um, and I've written two options, sushi or Indian, and then people can vote um, on, on one of them. And then afterwards, you can, uh, you know, you can sort of choose where you wanna go. Um, so say you want to have a certain uh, GIF that's along with these options. Now, of course, we've got stamps, we've got, um, uh, we've got uh, stickers, 
But say you want to find something that's out on the web um, in Giphy, you, there's this, uh, this cool uh, widget called Giphy Stickers allows you to search for, say, uh, I don't know, Indian food. And I like this one right here. And you can uh, pop that in here, press, uh, press enter, and then move that. So that's, that's, that's a cool one. And all right, so the next part is now you're getting into the meat of the meeting. Um, you're getting into, say, project planning. So here are two widgets uh, that I really like. One is called Timeline. And say you are planning out certain features depending on a particular time. And Timeline allows you to set uh, the, per the, the, the time that you want to map out. Um, and, and here we've got uh, one for the next couple of weeks. And so you, you would have a, a few stickers here. We've got a few features that we want to plan out. And we've, uh, we've, we've put it under the, uh, the, these particular dates. The other widget that I really like, which I know a lot of engineers um, uh, potentially struggle with, with uh, estimating features. And at my last company, we used to do this by rock, paper, scissors. Um, we actually built the tool where we would um, spin up a, um, a, a server and people would vote on how, how long a feature would take. But there's this really cool um, widget called Group Estimator uh, so that you can, you, everybody that's in the file can uh, vote and it's hidden. So uh, if a person votes that this takes, I don't know, two engineering days or three engineering days, uh, people won't get persuaded by, by uh, how each person votes. So here we've got two people in the file. Um, I voted this will take two engineering days. Let's say I think it's gonna take three engineering days. And then we finish voting and we see that the other person voted three as well too. So that's, that's a really cool one. All right, so now we're moving into a little bit more specific to engineering. Um, say you uh, are working on this feature and uh, folks uh, that are engineers are very familiar with uh, modeling applications uh, for, for, uh, for data. And so say you've got this uh, table, let's say we're gonna call it views um, and this, widget is called Entity Modeler. And you can create all the different rows here, ID created at, you can include descriptions. So for example, say the ID, we know we want a UUID there. We press done, and then we've got this visual representation of the table. Uh, say we want to create another table, um, and, and we can do the same thing there. We can also adjust the, uh, the arrow here to perhaps show a one-to-one -one or a one-to-many relationship. Um, so first, I, and now I want to take an aside at just talking about uh, plugins and widgets, widgets in general. Um, there is a section uh, on our, on our uh, let's see here, it's plugins, uh, can't find it here. Let's see here, there. There it is here, the uh, Figma and FigJam plugins um, API. So we've got a lot of documentation on if you want to create your own plugin or widget, we make it super simple. You don't have to be a, a, an engineer with a CS degree. Everything's there for you. So if you've got an idea, um, we've got all a lot of documentation. There's an API reference. So if you, uh, yeah, so it makes it super simple to create. And I wanna show you um, if you'd like to play around with uh, that API, you can actually access it in the console. So here's an example. We've got the code block here. And what we're going to do is we are going to insert uh, some code in this code block by using that API. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, select that code block. And we are going to um, uh, get, get that code block to play around with it. So we've got code block where Figma is this global object uh, that's available for you. We're gonna get the current page and we're gonna get the selection, which is an array. And the first one up is this code block. Okay, so now we've got the code block. 
um, to actually insert some, um, some text in there, we are going to need to load in the font for this code block. Um, and so here we, we uh, access figma.load font async and then the particular font. And then now we want to insert some code. So we are going to do code block dot code. And we're just going to do the classic hello world function, hello world and the like. And when we press return, we now see that that is there um, in, in the code block. And say, for example, we want to change the language, um, a code block dot code language. Say we want to change it to Rust. Notice the uh, syntax highlighting changes uh, specific to Rust. So dot code dot code language, uh, load font async, current page selection, that's all available in that API documentation. All right. And then finally, we are going to go to um, the last part, which is say you're at the end of your meeting and maybe you want to do a, a sort of a game at the end um, and you've got a, a lot of folks in the, in, uh, in the meeting and you want to separate people into teams. Here's a cool widget called Teams, which um, creates certain teams and people can join them and you have a visual representation. Um, and so I've joined Team Michael, um, but say I want to join Team Bella, and then that, that shows up over here. So that's kind of cool. I'll go back to Team Michael. And then another one is this happens a lot in meetings where maybe you want to do a round robin, um, you know, uh, how was your weekend or, or what have you. And as the facilitator, you don't want to keep track of who's already been, who's already been, um, who's already gone. So this is this cool this cool little widget is called whose turn is it? Um, it keeps track of who's in the meeting. And say we're going to do a random one to go first. We're going to go random, and it actually chose me. And notice it's grayed out, uh, so that we know that that person is already gone. Um, and yeah, so those are my favorite plugins and widgets in FigJam. Aaron, that was an incredible wealth of plugins. And if that wasn't enough, uh, you taught us how to code a little bit. So thanks a lot, man. That was awesome. Very engineering of you. Uh, all right. So we have two more people sharing. We're going to rush right in because I know they have so much more cool stuff to share. Uh, the next one is from Anna Boyer. Uh, Anna's on my team as well. And as a designer advocate on the community team, focused on helping teams become Figma pros and sharing tips on FigJam and prototyping, I especially love her prototyping tips. Uh, Anna loves doing all things creative. And as of late, she's been spending most of her free time sewing, knitting, and dancing. Anna, let's see what you've got. All right, thank you so much for the intro, Raji. Hi, I'm Anna, I'm a designer advocate on the community team. And today I'm gonna to be sharing a couple of prototyping tips with you guys. So the first one I want to touch on is Smart Animate Matching Layers. If you guys are familiar with Smart Animate at all, it basically allows you to create smooth transitions across different frames in your prototype by using um, similar naming systems between them. You can also combine Smart Animate with other transitions built into Figma using Smart Animate Matching Layers. So in this prototype here, a really common example I'm showing is using tabs as a way of navigating through your prototype. So I'm gonna select on a tab, and then you can see I've already drawn the link out. And if we click in to see the details of that, you'll see that I have the push navigation, meaning that when I click on this tab, I want to push over to the next screen. Um, but I've also clicked Smart Animate Matching Layers because I don't want that push interaction to apply to the entire screen. I still want the top content here, like my header and my navigation tabs to stay the same. I mainly just want that push transition to apply to the content below. So if we see what that actually looks like um, in this prototype here, I can click on the different tabs. You'll see everything above stays the same, but the main content below is what's changing. If I were to not click that checkbox uh, for Smart Animate Matching Layers, this is what it would look like. So everything is going to be sliding in, and that's not really the kind of interaction that I want. 
So yeah, this is a super useful um, thing to use if you want to combine Smart Animate with any other kinds of interactions that we have built into Figma. Uh, the next thing I want to show is using nesting. So um, nesting applies both to components that are used in different frames, but also components that are built into other components. So if any of you are familiar with interactive components, it essentially allows you to draw the same prototyping links that you would have between different screens, but instead within a component. Now how nesting comes into play is you can actually nest an interactive component within another one. So in here, I have this example where I have a grocery list and I wanna have multiple ways of interacting with each grocery item. So I wanna be able to check the box whenever I've successfully retrieved that item. And maybe I also wanna be able to star certain items as well. Um, so here I have an interactive component for the item text and the radio button. And then I have that also built into an additional interactive component that allows you then to add that star interaction. Um, so you can see right now, I have essentially just four uh, prototype links drawn out to create this interaction, but I could have it where instead of nesting interactive component in another, just have it all be one interactive component, but you can see the number of prototyping links I had to draw out. Um, is significantly more than what I have up here. So that just kind of shows how nesting components in each other just makes your prototype look a lot cleaner um, by reducing the number of links that you need to have. So looking at like a more complex example of this, we have this mobile design and have this bottom navigation. So I have these little action buttons that I want to be able to click on and I have an interactive state where I want the color of that button to change when I click on it. And then I have that brought into a interactive component of this bottom navigation where when I click on this large button, these smaller action buttons are going to pop up from behind it. So this is just showing another example of embedding, nesting a um, interactive component in another one. And you can see when I click on these action buttons and I look in the right-hand side on the prototype panel, you can see that that interaction is still preserved because it was already defined um, within this components space here. In addition, I have these little navigation points here where I want to be able to, depending on where I click, navigate across these four different screens. Now I've gone ahead and I've defined them at the component level. So when I want to navigate across the different screens, I don't have to draw an interaction from this home screen uh, linking to every other screen in this navigation here. Uh, because I've already defined it at the component level, those uh, links are going to propagate across all of the screens it's being used in. So we can see how this comes into play where I can click on the chat and the alert and the profile and it will automatically scroll me to them and I didn't have to go ahead and draw those links for the screen. They're already inherited from that component. Alrighty. Let me go back. Um, another thing that I wanted to show you guys is actually being able to combine interactive components with auto layout. So building prototypes within an auto layout frame um, actually applies when you're previewing the prototype as well. So let's go over here. Uh, so I have a frame with a bunch of different cards. These cards are interactive components that I named basic drag. And with these interactive components, I have these different states that they transition between. Um, but one of the key interactions I have in here is when I'm dragging my components to the left, it's going to transition into this purple state. And then if I keep dragging, it's going to change into this deleted state. Essentially, I've just changed the height of that component to be as close as zero to possible. This is really similar if you're using any kind of like um, mobile um, email app where maybe you want to swipe an element to delete it. This is following that same kind of interaction. Um, and so I have this delete interaction built into the interactive component. And then I have instances of this component living in a auto layout frame. 
So when I go into the prototype view, if I swipe to go into that delete state, you can see the other elements are going to shift up um, to fill that space that used to be occupied by that now deleted component. Um, so yeah, you can use auto layout in combination with interactive components and you'll be able to see your designs responsively change as uh, in the variant is switched within those components. Another really great interaction that I think a lot of people don't use that much is the scroll to interaction. So this is super useful if you're designing for carousels, if you have maybe a single page website design where you have a top navigation and depending on where you click, you wanna to scroll to that specific section of the web page, or if you're creating a map, for example. So let's dive into what this prototype looks like. So I have these different buttons I can click on to navigate to different points within my map. And my map is actually, um, part of it is hidden because I've set the frame that it lives inside to click content. Something that's really important to keep in mind is to have scroll apply in your prototype. So you need to make sure that the content that you're actually having scroll uh, takes up more space in the frame that it actually is contained inside. Uh, let's uncheck this box though so you can actually see the full map. And you can see here, I have all of these different location pins and they each have a frame that basically defines what is the area in which I want to scroll to. So for example, with this purple button, I wanna to navigate to the purple pin and you can see that there's a prototype link drawn out to this designated um, frame that I've drawn out for the purple pin. And it's set to that scroll to interaction here. So let's go back and clip the content because we don't want to see the full map. And if we look at the prototype that we have, if I click on orange, it's going to scroll to that orange pin, uh, pink, scroll to the pink pin, and then back to the green one. Okay, uh, one last tip I wanna share about prototyping is the ability to actually have a prototype open up another web page in a tab, or you could also link to another prototype um, if that's something that you're looking for. But essentially how you do it is maybe I want this little FAQ um, text at the bottom of my web page to link out to website. So if you go into your interactions, I've already said to click, you can see all of these different um, interactions that are available to you, but I wanna hit open link. And I went ahead and I just pasted it in google.com. So when I go to the prototype, I'm going to click here and then you'll notice it went ahead and opened the web page. So yeah, this is really great just for, um, I think adding that additional level of fidelity or also if you wanna link to any other prototypes um, to create more of a smoother transition. So yeah, that's um, all of the tips that I have to share with you guys. That's all, as if that was just a few. <laughs> you packed our <laughs> brains. And I especially love, I, when you shared it with me, the whole sort of like list view and the delete to slide and the fact that everything just sort of like the UI moves up. Um, I love that tip as well as so many others. All right, we have one more person coming on stage to share with you. This is Willie Wu. Uh, Willie is a software engineer who works on delightful features across prototyping, Fig Jam, and the Figma editor. What I love most about Willie is that he always has so much fun in the things that he does. Uh, so currently, Willie is learning how to train a dog and also getting to know good Bay Area hikes. All right, Willie, come on, let's see your fun. Let's see what you've got. Hi, everyone. So I'll be talking a little bit about some of the fun things that I've made in Figma and and very at a very high level, just like how you might be able to either make them or recreate them. And for one case, I'm actually gonna give you a community file. So let's let's dive right in. Let's talk about the uh, fun that you can make with prototypes. Now, I've dug up a lot of my past files of stuff that I've made in Figma. And I think the most interesting one is probably visual novels. So for those of you who don't know, visual novels are sort of like partly a video game partly a comic with it's like illustrations and and dialogue and text that you can click through and you can make the, the, like different decisions sometimes and you can make them in figma 
in a prototype in a pretty straightforward way all you need is a lot of frames and some transitions some quick transitions and some brief animations to, to glue it all together um another thing you can make or actually let me send you this link to this community file which is a template of an activity that you can play with a group of people and uh, by the end of this activity you will have built a visual novel All right, the next thing is BuzzFeed quizzes, BuzzFeed and code. Now, this is a this is another fun prototype where in this case, here's a BuzzFeed quiz that I made for a bunch of Figma interns where based on your decisions and which flavors you like, it pairs you up with an intern who you're most similar to. Now, this is also pretty straightforward to make. All you need is a bunch of frames and depending on the button, you sort of create this tree of decisions and with depending on the path you go down to at the very bottom, you have the different profiles of each of each of the people. And finally, you can do animations in in the viewer. And now I'm not talking about smart animate or or easing. This is an animation that I ended up making for the cursor high fives feature, which I worked on in Figam. And the way that this animation is built is also with a lot of frames. For each frame, I individually like move the different parts, so it's like a stop motion animation or like a frame by frame animation. And when you go into the prototype viewer, you just spam the right arrow key as fast as you can, and it plays the animation. All right, let's talk about fun that you can have with components. Um, here's another game that I made called Pictionary Telephone, um, where there's you get a bunch of players and you take you take turns going through different rounds where you take the previous person's drawing and you have to write a caption about it and then you alternate between that and taking the previous person's caption and you have to draw it very quickly and this is accomplished using components in a very sneaky way um, where if you have a main component and you draw into it all of the instances Will automatically get updated with what you drew so you can have almost like a portal where you can draw into one canvas and then it gets sent and synchronized over to the other canvases and this allows the whole game to be set up almost as if you have different players sent into the circle whereas the last player when they draw it into this last row it actually gets warped right back to the first row so that you can sort of emulate that the players are you know passing these different drawings around in a circle. Um, and the last thing I'm going to present today is using components in a creative way to make pop-up cards. And this is a birthday card that I made where if you resize this rectangle, you have a bunch of faces popping up on this on this card. And the way this is done is if you use an auto layout frame, you can take a main component and instantiate it in an instance inside an auto layout frame which when it grows taller, it actually pushes an image up based on like how auto layout works and relays out the, the contents. And then you can take your auto layout frame and you make that another component and you turn on clip contents so that you don't actually see the face until the rectangle here is big enough. And then now you have a component, you can go ham with it and you can put it everywhere you, you want. So yeah, those are just some fun things you can do in Figma of my own invention, I guess. Um, hopefully this has inspired you to go play around and make your own things. Great. So I'm going to pass it back to Raji to close this up. Thanks so much. All right. Great. Uh, Willie, thank you so much. Uh, just in case you didn't know too, Willie represented this like super fun, like very cool side of what he does, but Willie also worked on auto layout. I heard a lot of auto layout stands in the chat just saying, I love auto layout. Uh, well, Willie, right there, he worked on auto layout. Okay, it has been a tremendous session and thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I know that we went a little bit late, but everybody has spent so much time to prepare this content. So thank you for sticking around with us. If you were not able to, uh, there's always going to be uh, our recordings up or if you came in late. So this session is gonna be recorded, it'll be available 
on youtube.com slash Figma design within a week. We are going to chop this up into smaller segments so it's easier to parse. You can kind of jump into the segment that kind of works for you. Also remember, uh, we're gonna be doing live streams throughout the year with you all. So if you have any suggestions or ideas or maybe critiques, uh, community at figma.com is a great place to talk to us about our live streams. Now, the other thing uh, is that we have future live streams all available at figma.com slash events. You can just go there and then you can see which ones are coming up and RSVP to those. Now, <laughs> as if we have enough events, uh, we're looking for speakers for config. This is our conference. Uh, it is amazing. Uh, it's going to be available at sessionize.com slash config 2022. Hopefully we can get a link in the chat, but we're looking for people to actually propose some talks to us uh, to see what amazing ideas that you all have. Uh, we get our best talks from the community, from you all, uh, because y'all are doing the work. You're the ones that love Figma and really have great stories to share. So with that being said, I just want to say thank you so much to the incredible Figmates on our team for all putting this together. It was an honor to host them. Thank you all so much for coming and being a part of this and just being so jazzed on all the things that were shared. I have been Raji King. I've been your host and thank you so much. And with that, we're done. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have an amazing day. Do some stuff with some components, do some cool stuff, share it with us. Uh, we'd love to see it. We'll see you later. Thanks so much.